I think we can move on to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is chemical identification for field study, which is section 3.1 in the uh, binder. And I think Patty's going to present. Um, I will start the, the presentation. And we have three speakers on this uh, special section. Uh, me, Patty Wong, and Dr. Randy Medellina, coming from Lawrence Berkeley Lesson Lab, and also Alexander Hooker. He's from OEHA as a staff. Okay. This section will cover the process for identifying chemical for field study and the use of supplemental information to facilitate this chemical identification process. The goal of this uh, process is to establish an extensive list of synthetic turf chemicals for our targeted chemical analysis of field samples. We'll go do it by stepwise. The first one we're going to do is to build a potential turf chemical and through literature search and reveal uh, for chemicals that are used in, with, on turf components. And then step two uh, is to build a list of chemicals that's identified in the synthetic turf. Uh, we are using Chrome rubber come collect from California as well as from the manufacturer in California. And uh, also we will go, the sample will go for a range of experiment, extraction, chromatographic method. The primary focus is using mass spec to identify this chemical. And then the next step, the last step, is expanding this list of identified chemical with unknown chemical that is found from field samples as well as from age sample generated in the lab. And where technical feasible, we will identify any previously unidentified peak, we call it unknown peak, find in the step two. Once we identify it, we'll add it back to the known chemical list, which is used as a target chemical analysis for our field study. I want to point out here that our targeted chemical list is a dynamic list. As soon as we come across with chemical we can identify further down the process, we will add it to our list, and all the sample will be analyzed based on what we find and the database we build. Actually, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab will build. Thank you, Patty. Okay, um, the first step. Building a list of potential synthetic turf chemical. Before we start, I want to introduce you, uh, I'll briefly describe the database we'll use. Uh, we're going to use the National Institute of Standards and Technology Database, the NIST database. The database is compi compiled by NIST, as well as EPA and the, the federal EPA and the NIH, National Institute of Health and they compile a mass spec library. And here's some information about the version and the data and the library we're going to use. Uh, we're going to use computer spectrum matching and mass, mass ion ratio, uh, fragmentation fingerprint, and to identify chemicals that are coming extracted from the turf material. And for more complex peak, uh, it will go through a deconvolution process before the spectrum matching. And Dr. Madalena will give you more detail today. So the first list are potential chemicals. We have conducted a series of literature search and combining some of the work from the US EPA. Uh, we identified potential chemical linked to the turf material. And some of them are within the NIST database. And some of them we still uh, we haven't so far identified in the library yet, and we call it supplemental list. And Dr. Alexander Hooker will give you more information today on how to use it. Step two: uh, identifying the chemical that is in the turf material. We will go through uh, material coming from the manufacturer and also from our pilot study. We'll go through um, 
several chemical analysis. First is emission chamber. Uh, we call, make it simple, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we call it the lab here. We'll go through uh, emission chamber experiment. Uh, we anticipate most come out with volatile organic chemical, VOC, we represent in green here. All the data will match with the NIST database and generate a spectrum of chemical for the turf. Uh, some semi-VOCs will be coming out from this study and in the database. And the next experiment is thermal extraction. Chrome rubber will be hit, and we expect, again, VOC will come and will add to the, to the sphere. And then semi-VOC will come more at this point because it's higher temperature added to the database. We also expect some of the non-volatile chemical may also be emitted during the thermal extraction added to the database. The next one is solvent extraction. Uh, during our last meeting, the panel has suggested that we should have a solvent extraction uh, to increase the coverage of the chemical. And we are going to use solvent with different polarity in order to extract VOC, add it as VOC. Non-VOC will be more. Uh, every additional chemical will build in. And then also metals, because we will be using also polar solvent here. The last one uh, is the biofood extraction. And more detail will be provided later. And we, once we build up for the first experiment, we expect that the list is already expanding. The additional chemical coming from the biofood extraction will be added to the, to the sphere as it go. SVOC, non-VOC, and also metals. So at the end, this list will be compiled to make it as a list matched it uh, at the identified turf chemical. And this is the list we're going to use for analyzing our field sample. So just a pictorial representation on how we see this chemical now the list library, and we have literature search that's potential chemical linked. And our match chemical from the experiment, we expect there will be a lot of overlap here, and maybe some not overlap from the potential list. And we are matching with the NIST database, so it should be within the sphere here. So next, uh, Dr. Randy Maddalena will give the presentation on the chemical process. And I'm passing it to him. Okay, thank you. And thank you, members of the panel. I think this one works too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to almost repeat what you just heard in a little bit more technical level, a little bit more from the laboratory's perspective, um, and, and kind of fill in some of the blanks that were, were presented. So you just got a taste of our approach to try and go after what's in these samples. And I'll try and fill that in a little bit as we go. Um, so the statement of the problem, at least from the chemist's perspective, is there's going to be a lot of chemicals or there are a lot of chemicals potentially in, in the components of synthetic turf. That's very technical language. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, to, but, but to make it even a little bit more complicated, some of these chemicals are going to change their, their chemical identity over time or under different conditions. So you might start with a fresh batch of crumb, for example, that has a chemical fingerprint, and you put it out under the sun or expose it to ozone, you may have a different fingerprint in different compositions. So, so you're going to deal with those changes in time as well. Um, but the bottom line is sample collection and analysis methods, what we apply in the field, work best when we know what we're looking for. They really do. And so if we do our homework ahead of time and put together a fairly extensive list or at least comprehensive as we can, it makes the lab work go smoother once we start bringing samples in from the field. So really the question is, how do we know what to look for in these materials? And so I'm going to kind of go through sort of a systematic approach. As Patty mentioned, we sort of build this around the, the mass spectral libraries, which is a nice thing about those mass spectral libraries is they sort of address what the panel mentioned earlier about if we can get some consistency from lab to lab, we might be able, be able to come up with comparable information. And these databases that the NIST that NIST has put together with a quarter of a million chemicals in them have come from just that exercise. The, the analysts use similar 
um, conditions when they are analyzing chemicals. They produce mass spectra. The mass spectra are validated and put into a database. And so each time someone runs that same analysis with those same conditions, they can look for a fingerprint. So that is what the beauty of, of what was mentioned before is. Um, so I am going to introduce the fact that there are really two basic approaches that we can do to use to go after chemicals, uh, unknown chemicals. The first is somewhat of a top-down approach. Um, the question is, is it there? I mean, we are given a name or a cast number, and the question is, can we find that or identify a peak that has that name in our sample? And the other approach is sort of the bottom-up approach, um, and that is where we ask the question, what is there? So we have a sample, and we have lots of peaks in our sample in a chromatogram, and we want to know if we can give a name to any of those peaks. So one comes from, I want to look for this, and one comes from, I found this, I need to identify it. Um, the most effective and efficient strategy ultimately probably combines those two approaches to a certain degree with a heavy dose of professional judgment um, from the analyst as you move forward. Um, but either approach that you end up taking in both approaches tend to converge at this matching of mass spectra. Um, and the gold standard matching mass spectra with uh, including retention times. So if you have the same fingerprint and it comes out of an instrument, a chromatographic column at the same time, it's super high likelihood that it's the right chemical. You've, you've identified the chemical you're after. So I'm going to say a few things about this process of matching mass spectra just to kind of, I mean, it's, it's not a chemistry class, but I just want to build up some confidence in the tools that we have and what we have to work with. Um, on the screen now is an illustration of a chromatogram um, that uh, goes through a, a gas chromatogram that, where chemicals are placed on the front end of the column and pushed through and they separate uh, as they move through the column. So time is on the, on the x-axis in a response area, which is somewhat proportional to mass is on the, on the y-axis as you move across this. And each one of these peaks, if your method is working right, is an individual chemical. Um, we will see in a minute that that is not always the case. But often you have several dominant peaks in an environmental sample. And in this case, I have highlighted one of those dominant peaks. Typically, these, these dominant peaks, if they are in the environment already, um, they are almost always readily available in the, in the NIST library. Um, you don't usually get surprises that just show up in the environment. Things sort of build up over time. They give the, the scientists time to respond and put together the right mass spectra and get them in the library. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, so what we do once we find one of these dominant peaks is you could feed it into the NIST software. And once it, I wanted to just point out here that the, the chromatogram gives you more than just a peak. You get a spectra along with that peak when you're using mass spectrometry. And across the top is that spectra or the fingerprint of that particular chemical. Um, you could feed that into the database, the NEST database, and look for matches. And that's kind of the bottom-up approach to identifying compounds in a, a sample. Again, as I mentioned before, you know, the gold standard, the confirmation, once you get a fairly confident hit or potential identity, is to compare it to a standard. Um, sometimes those standards aren't available, but if the chemical's in the environment, usually someone's taking the time to, to purify a standard for you. This approach, in an environmental sample anyways, usually gives you up to 70 or 80 percent of your mass in the sample with a name. You can identify a pretty good chunk of your mass using this approach for the dominant peaks. The problem is, um, that may not get you all of what you're really interested in. So there are often, I put a little circle over here at 25, 42 in that region, there's, there's smaller peaks on your chromatogram, and sometimes those smaller peaks are kind of messy, and they get into points where they have multiple chemicals coming out at the same time. So there are several options for trying to improve that and try and get names for those peaks. Um, one, of, one of them is to change your chroma chromatography, try and figure out how to get a better separation. That's kind of expensive. It takes some time. Sometimes it's new columns, new, new methods. Uh, it takes a little bit of time. The other one is to utilize a different detector that looks specifically for a sulfur or a nitrogen, for example. Um, or you can e increase your sample size, but the downfall to that is it also increases the noise, so you don't gain much there. Um, the fa final one, which I'm going to talk a little more about, is you can actually use some techniques to mathematically clean up a chromatogram. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now. 
That's the approach we like to take. It's a, probably the fastest and cheapest. Um, more software that came out of NIST. This actually came out of the uh, some security um, weapons type laws, and, and uh, there was some software that was developed that actually allows you to sort of dig down into chrom chromatograms. And what I'm showing here is taking that peak on the, on the left that, that clearly is a mixture of multiple peaks and feeding it into the top of the software. Essentially, the software from NIST um, looks for mass ions that sort of correlate very strongly. So if you have a peak that comes out, all of those lines that go up at the same time, you assume they're from the same chemical. And then you pull those ions out, build a fingerprint, and send that into the NIST library for identification. It's a really powerful tool, and it really allows you to get down into those smaller, noisier peaks and still get fairly good matches. Um, again, gold standard, standards, retention times uh, for confirmation. A lot of times you can gain maybe 10 or 20 percent more identification in your chromatogram. So circling back around and summarizing, um, the bottom-up approach, essentially what we're using in the lab, uh, in an environmental sample, uh, you know, a vial of crumb, for example, uh, the dominant peaks are almost always in the mass spectral library. So we're going we're gonna to nail those quick, and we've got those already. Minor peaks are a little more tricky because they're kind of messy, um, and we have to work a little harder to get those. But ultimately, we get those. We work on confirmation. There's some feedback between OEA as far as, well, what's important, what's not, what should we look closer at. Um, but ultimately, we'll you know, get more than 90% of the mass fairly easily. Um, the top-down <coughs> approach, say, okay, well, what about the other 10%? Well, that's where you start digging and start looking, and that's expensive and time-consuming, but you certainly can do that. Um, the most, uh, I'll come back later and repeat this, but the most, the simplest way is to get a standard. If a standard's available, you train your instrument to look for a particular chemical, and that can be done. Um, I want to point out, though, that the sample is only as good as what you've sort of collected. So if I'm collecting air, the conditions that I'm collecting that air in will dictate what things I might find in that sample. And so we use that to help kind of streamline our ability to, to analyze things. We can clean up chromatograms a little bit by only sampling parts of the world at any given time. And uh, the first test we did, I'll go through a little bit of, of experiments here just to show you. The first test that we conducted was emission chamber test, excuse me, following the you know, standard emission chamber, small chamber test methods. And it, these are done at, at fairly mild conditions, uh, 25 degrees, 50 percent humidity. And we run, in this case, we ran. Excuse me. Yes. Oh, let's say just room temperature, yeah. room temperature conditions, and, and kind of a mild room temperature is, is the, the, the point is it's consistent each time. Um, so we don't expect to see a lot of, a lot of heavy compounds, uh, the semi-volatile compounds. Mostly we want to, we're going to see things in the volatile range, and that's the case if you look at the, the chromatogram that comes out. Um, the beauty of this approach is we have... I mean, ultimate confidence that the material we see is coming from the material we're testing. There's nothing else in these chambers to, to contribute to our, our chromatogram. We're going to repeat this process several times with aging, um, various aging factors. We'll talk about those a little later in the presentation. And we'll continue to look at changes in this chromatogram over time and see if anything new pops up. You know, that's the beauty of working, I mean, kind of toot our own horn, we're actually not a contract lab. I know we have to be referred to as that, but we're a research lab. And so you're going to get a situation where we're not going to stop looking. I mean, we're not going to get our list and then just focus on that list. So that's kind of the beauty of it. Um, the next experiment we did in developing our bioaccessibility methods, uh, we have access to a stir bar system that is more of a sorbent system. You put the sample in an aqueous solution along with this uh, sink, I would say, that captures chemicals that move out of the crumb or turf, whatever you're analyzing. And so we expect this type of a method to, to collect more of the heavier compounds, more of the high KOW compounds, things that want to be in the lipid phase. 
in the fat phase. Um, and so you can look at the chromatogram here and you can see that the, the peaks compared to the last chromatogram going back and then this one, the peak sort of shifted to the right, which is where the heavier compounds tend to like to come out of the instrument. And following that same matching process, we came up with another 76 to 80 compounds, um, nine of which were in the previous test. So it's identifying new compounds, and that was our goal, is to try and separate compounds before we put them on the instrument, and it helps us to you know, isolate things. Just a point of cl clarification for me, perhaps others. So this is an inert stir bar. It's not going to be, um, chemicals aren't going to be absorbing onto it or? The idea is to absorb chemicals onto it. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. But then so we I, put I, it in an instrument and heat it up and yeah, take so them back off. I think you need, that's what I thought. Thank so. you very much. There's going to be more detail on each of these methods in, yes, the, okay. in the later talks about, you know, the actual experiments to characterize emissions and, and such. Um, so thank you for, for that clarification. The, the next one that we, we tested was, again, things that are really give us high confidence that what we're seeing is coming from the material that we're studying. And in this case, if you look in the, the little picture up in the, there's a little black dot in amongst a lot of glass wool in this glass straw. And that little dot is maybe a half a dozen grains of crumbs. So it's a very small sample in this case, but it's placed directly into a glass straw that's placed into the instrument that's heated and collected uh, as you go. And in this case, we're even pushing farther to the semi-volatile range because we actually heat it up, heat the sample to 100 and, uh, I wish I had the conversions, I'm sorry I don't, but we heat it quite hot <laughs> first uh, and, and we collect material and then we heat it even hotter. And when we heat it hotter, we, we turn valves on so we get rid of some and not kill our instrument and collect even more material. And the chromatogram you see has really shifted quite a ways to, to the right now. And so we see a lot more heavier, a lot more, that's hard, bad English, but a lot heavier compounds coming out. Um, and in this method, we added another you know, 53 compounds identified. 30 of which had been identified in the previous test. So we continue to get more each time we look at it a different way. And we're not done. Um, we're coming into the solvent extraction part next, and we've got uh, a system that's a fairly automated system with accelerated solvent extraction. It pressurizes the material and heats the material. We don't want to go too far because, like even in the previous one, going to 300 degrees Celsius, if we go much higher, we start thermally degrading the material. It just... It just crumb just falls apart. It just gets too hot. It's not going to burn necessarily, but it will emit things that aren't necessarily available or realistic. So in this case, the, the solvent extraction uses high pressure and, and elevated temperature and does a really nice job of systematically removing things. And so we'll work through various solvents uh, and go through different analytical paths to continue to continue to build on that, that previous list. Um, so I'll point out there's other tools available to us. Uh, the one I sort of on the previous slide was the liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, and that basically is a way to get some chemicals through your instrument that you normally couldn't do in the gas phase. And so you can put it in the liquid phase, send it through an instrument, and still detect by mass spectrometry. Often it's a simpler um, ionization process, so you get very precise mass ions and help you identify your chemicals there. Um, metal species, uh, there's a completely different instrument to play with the metal species, and that's, that'll be fairly straightforward. Um, but in both of those cases, we're going to have to come up with some method, and we're working towards that, to present a, a or to report a bioaccessible fraction or bioaccessible concentration, and that's going to be talked about in some later presentations. Um, and mentioned earlier, there are other detectors you could play with. Sulfur detector might be very important for this particular work because a lot of sulfur species are involved in, in crumb rubber in particular. Um, and there are other detectors, like I said earlier, for nitrogen and phosphorus. So if we get really into the point of trying to identify things that are down in the noise, um, those will help us in the forensics type investigations to understand. Um, but we can't identify the whole universe. So this slide's meant to tell you that there is some prioritization. So if for example, if, if we see a peak that we haven't identified in a lot of you know, high frequency de of detection, uh, that might be of interest to look at, or high concentrations, um, or going from the other direction top down, if there's something we haven't found 
but other people have and they are particularly toxic or irritants or smelly, then those might be important to look at. Um, and that's where we would go after the top-down approach. Um, ultimately, we're going to pull all this information together, and we've already started sort of building this information into a library, uh, which allows us, once we go to the field and get field samples, to scan them fairly quickly and understand how many peaks or chemicals we've identified and how much mass that we haven't. So that's the, that's the uh, um, approach. And again, I'll circle back. We're a, a research lab, so we're interested. We're going to keep looking. If we find things we don't know, we tend to work to try and figure out what it is. I think then I, I can hand it off now. So any questions from here? Or do we wait? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll wait the question until finish this, this section. Now we will discuss the step three is how to expand the chemical list that of the identified turf chemical using supplemental information. I pass the presentation to Dr. Hooker. Thank you. Uh, I'm a staff scientist with OEHA, uh, and um, this slide really presents um, our approach to tackle chemicals that are not on the NIST database and therefore would be difficult to identify through mass spectral matching um, that uh, Randy just previously described. So we have assembled a supplemental chemical list consisting of chemicals that are not included in the NIST database that is intended as a go-to list for, the, for chemical identifications of substances um, that failed um, to be identified. Uh, this may be of particular importance for LCMS data uh, because this has uh, been a, a rather big uh, data gap in the past. So we have amassed 100 chemicals on this list by decreasing likelihood that they may be included in synthetic turf materials uh, from tiers 1 to 2 to 3. Um, these chemicals very briefly um, were identified in air samples at indoor or outdoor synthetic turf fields, uh, were identified in leachates of either crumb rubber or whole tire leachates, were also found in biofluid or methanol extracts in the past or synthetic turf blade organic solvent extract, so the, the plastic pieces, not the rubber itself, which also has presented a big data gap in the past. Um, tier two, sort of a, a decrease in likelihood that these may be found, um, more of a worker exposure. Here, these are uh, chemicals identified in air samples at automobile or truck retreading facilities, so not directly related to um, synthetic turf, sort of a precursor to that. Um, studies where it was not quite clear what the source of rubber was. It could have been tire, it could have been a synthetic rubber material, and then also harsh solvent ex extracts. And then tier three is a rather interesting uh, list of chemicals. These are chemicals identified in a previous um, IARC report of 1982, uh, mostly consisting of uh, tire additives that were used in manufacturing. Um, and then a separate list are ones that are used as biocides on synthetic turf. So this constitutes a list of 100 chemicals that are not included on the NIST database and should help us identify unknowns in our analysis. So um, I'm going to walk through the process on how we're going to use it to identify the chemical. Uh, as we, we mentioned before, sample from manufacturer from the pilot study will go through uh, chemical analysis compared to the, the NIST library here. If there's a mass spectrum match, yes, become a known peak, add it to the chemical list. No, so we have unknown peak. We're going to compare with the supplemental information here, and Dr. Hooker will give more detail on how we're going to use the list. And if there's a match, we can choose to pursue either buying a pure standard to further confirm the chemical and then add it to the list. Like we said, it's a dynamic list. We're adding more chemical as we find them. And if there's a no, we can match it with our supplemental information and also the NIST database, which contain a quarter million chemicals on it. Uh, if there's a serious consideration, we should go further. Uh, the next step will be the non-target analysis. It will, it will be a very extensive 
process and time time consuming process. So we we need to balance on how much chemical or how how many chemical projects uh, should go through this process and and evaluate the resources and the focus. And if we can do the non-target analysis, if we can tentatively identify the chemical, if we find the standard, we can add it back to the list. So the goal is to grow the list on chemical we can identify for this extensive process. So uh, back to Dr. Hooker. So just a very brief example. Um, I'll keep this as simple as I can. Um, so let's take a, an unknown peak that was identified from an LCMS fraction. Um, so let's say the mass was 288.16, and now the question, of course, is what do we do? What if there's no mass spectra available that we can match it against? So our, our first uh, strategy would be to go to our supplemental chemical list of 100 chemicals, try and match up those masses, uh, naturally accounting for charge states and counter ions that, may be, uh, that might change that mass. If we find a match, um, um, so I have an example here. We come up with a tentative identification of a chemical, this phenylene diamine compound. Uh, the mass matches. The water solubility and the boiling point makes sense. If it came out in an LCMS fraction, it gives us a little bit of confidence that this um, indeed is this chemical. Um, the source cites that it is an antioxidant that has been used in the tire industry, so that gives us further confidence that this likely is the compound. Um, but still, it's still uh, tentative. Uh, to go a step further, uh, we would want to um, result to higher resolution mass spectrometry methods and then use um, a method that has been referenced um, by Little and all uh, to use spectraless approaches uh, matching up these masses against CAS or ChemSpider databases. Um, and this is really where you can't typically buy standards uh, because a lot of the non-NIS chemicals don't have standards, so we really have to resort to this kind of method. And just to be clear, this is the more expensive and time-consuming consuming, consuming uh, procedure that you mentioned, Patty? Uh, what I mentioned was the non-target. When we don't, after matching the list, the supplemental list, we still don't find a match for the spectrum. The but this is still a tentative ID. So would you, how much of an effort is to go further with this CAS chem spider database matching? Is that something you would routinely do uh, in this kind of situation? We have to evaluate when we get there. Yeah, that's what I thought. I just want to be clear about that. So the, now go back to uh, another flow chart. Um, once we establish a list using the manufacturing sample, using the first pilot study, uh, first phase of the sample, fill sample to fill up the list, uh, the next step is now we go out to the field and collect sample throughout California. And implementing the, the method we have developed, uh, the lab has developed. And uh, also the lab will develop some aging material using artificial simulation weathering process. And it will first go through the chemical analysis and then try to identify with our existing target list now. And if there's a match, it shows that the chemical is pleasant on the turf field that we sample. If there's no match, then we'll go back to what we previously described, uh, going through the supplemental information, see whether we can identify it, depends on the effort, uh, what are the process we can the best identify the chemical, and trying to find the standard, the process to identify the chemical. If we find a new chemical, we'll add it back to the list, and now we're expanding the list. So we expand the list by the new chemical find in the field. So as we go on sampling the field, if we find new chemical we can identify, it will expand our search on the chemical. And this is for the section. And um, Thank you, Patty. I guess I would start off with saying, uh, does the panel have general comments on the approach to chemical identification? Oh. Thank you very much. It was informative. So this is a bit technical. I, I'm, I know an analytical chemist once told me, he said, when you have a sample, it's about extraction, separation, and identification. Right? 
So that's what they were explaining to us in, in a lot of detail. That is extracting the chemical from the sample, having methods like chromatography to separate out so you can start identifying. And I want to make uh, an important point going back to our first meeting. I mean, one is, is I think we're here to determine whether we have confidence that what's being proposed will actually do that. That is, uh, extract all the chemicals we want to know about and identif uh, separate identify. But the question that was raised at the first meeting that I thought really gave rise to this is we said there's two extractions that matter. One is we really want to know what's in this substance. That was, that was a big unknown going into this study. And I think we're going to see that, you know, hoping the public, I have quite a bit of confidence that this is, is useful, that we're going to know what's in crumb rubber and synthetic turf. But then there was this other extraction that I th thought was, was more important, ultimately, is not what you can get, what a good chemist can get out of, tell us, can a good chemist, you know, good chemistry can tell us what's there. But the other question is, what's bioavailable? And that's a different extraction. But you can't do the second one until you do the first one. You have to know what's there, and then you have to come in with the second step, which is, I think we'll hear more about it, which is coming up with the biofluids to ask, what does a human skin surface and saliva extract from crumb rubber? It's a totally different question. And again, it's, you, you've got the foundation. You also, I think, have the foundation to build to answer that question. And that's very... That's where I think this can be really useful to a risk assessment. That's what we need to know in addition. So if a chemical is going to get into somebody, it has to be there, but not all chemicals that are in crumb rubber are really going to be bioavailable. So these, there's these two separate analytical questions. And, I, and again, I'm trying to simplify, but I think the methods here, you know, I think for us the question is, uh, is this going to be sufficient to address public concerns and to address the public health question about What's there, what's there in total, and what's there that will be bioavailable to the children and people playing on the field? So, yeah, and, again, I, I, think I would add, just one second, I would add one other important point. I'm, a, I'm impressed with the, the amount of effort that is going into identifying every possible chemical. But there's also the issue of which chemicals in the bioavailable fuel fluid uh, are in greatest abundance, because it's a basic toxicological point, uh, the dose makes the poison. Uh, so we do need to know not just every single little chemical, uh, but you know what are the big, the big players and potential bad actors. Well, if you do your, your identification is both <laughs> substance and quantity, if it's done correctly. Yeah, and, yeah. and I understand that, but I just want to make it clear to the public. I know our chemists know this. But. I'm wondering, because you mentioned that when you're doing the exposure to the air, you're using sort of rim temperature. But I was also wondering if it would be possible to, A, make it a little bit warmer, to, because kids play a lot of soccer in July and August and September. But also, would it be possible to add ozone to the chambers so that you're getting the reaction products as they're coming off the volatile ones. I mean, you're aging it, but those chemical, you know, that, that not necessarily getting the volatiles because they'd be leaving. But if you add ozone to the chamber, I'm just curious how much that would change it and if that might be something we'd be concerned about because kids tend to play a lot of soccer in that hot ozone season. Why don't we get an answer to that first? So, very good. Yes, that's that's actually part of that cycle back through the aging process. We're looking at elevated temperature, ozone events, rain events, things like that that are going to modify the emissions. And to to speak to Dr. McCone's point, in addition to the extraction, separation, and identification, there is the collection and you can collect your sample in a way that gets different things and so that was the, the multiple experiments that we're doing to try and find identity they're coming from different experiments that collect different types of chemicals and then allow us to separate and identify Dr. Sheldon 
Um, first of all, you guys are working very hard at this, and um, you certainly have taken to heart what we recommended last time. Um, over the years in environmental work, I've always been concerned about analytical space. You know, as we know, all of the things that we can analyze only reach an analytical space, and you're trying to expand that very hard. Um, what I would recommend is that as you go through the list that you've put together and EPA has put together, look at some of those chemicals that you are still worried about the analytical space. If you can get standards, add them to your analysis and see if your analytical space is actually covering that or if it's not. Um, you know, if it's not, probably it's not because you really are extending it as far as you can. But I think there's always the question of, you know, why does somebody think this is haz hazardous and we're not finding anything? And at least that will help you define what things you can see and what things you can't see. And I hope that, you know, without, oh, of course it's work. I know it's work. But um, without adding a whole lot of work. Um, the other thing is, and again, this is really a research thing, but it always intrigues me and you, you mentioned it, is that um, as you look at the chromatograms and everything, um, are there patterns that you start to see so that as you go to turf fields, if you, you know, can you identify patterns as you are collecting information? If you have patterns, it would really help. Um, you know, if you don't, um, it won't help, but that may in the long run help us to say, yes, this is from the turf, um, not from the ambient air, not from something else. Any response, uh, Dr. Maddalena? Yes. So for the record, he, he Actually, agrees with I, that. I will, I will respond. That, the, the analytical space comment is, is, is excellent. I think we need to bound our analysis and say we can see up to chemical X. And if it's beyond that, I mean, we got to have another method. And I think that's fantastic to. You just need to know that you can't do it. I mean, already you are pouring tremendous resources into this. And so I'm not saying that you have to cover everything, but know what you are covering. Dr. Kyle. Well, I'm going to go back to the general comments part first and just say, I think this is really cool. You know? um, don't you guys think this is cool? I mean, I mean, I, um, and I really appreciate it, the clarity with which you explained it and the people, all of you together. You must have practiced that to have everyone chime in at the right time. Um, the, the, the question or issue I have is that um, it's important to characterize what's in this stuff because we're taking it from the road, right, and, the, and then we're putting it in playgrounds for kids. And so where a lot of times we might have some idea what our stuff is, and th in this case we're taking something from a very different environment and then moving it over for children to play on. And so this question of what's there is, it's sort of elevated compared to some cases where we're looking at substances. So, you know, I just want to acknowledge that as we, we, we I think everyone recognizes this is a lot of time and energy. It's a lot of work. But there is some reason for that, um, given what we're planning to use it for, what it's being used for. Then my other comment is, and I don't know if this is a comment or a question, but this it's not likely that these, um, I think, that these samples are all going to be the same. You know, you're going to have different mixes of chemicals in different fields at different times from tires from China or, or where they have the new standards or this or that. And so how, I'm not sure how you're going to interpret that in light of what you're doing. You know, you're, th this method makes sense if you were um, having something that's fairly consistent. You know, you can say, well, what are the chemicals in this? But you don't really have that necessarily. You have stuff that, you know, for, may, may have different chemicals in it at the beginning, and that may change over time. And that's part of the conundrum here is, you have a fundamentally poorly characterized substance that is being repurposed, again, in a children's environment. And so I'm just wondering how to think about that issue in light of what you're doing. There can be changes from weathering. You know, there can be changes from uh, over time. But there might also just be different mixes that you're seeing, and I think we would expect that. So how does that factor in, or is that an unanswerable question? I'm not sure. 
Very good point. Um, we're trying to capture as much variability as we can in the controlled environments first, like you said, with the aging and the, and the testing samples from multiple fields, uh, multiple plants or, uh, or manufacturers, uh, different bags from the manufacturer. So we've got a very broad spectrum of, of material to start with and start understanding a little bit about what that variability is, and then eventually it's going to go into the field design, the sampling design in the field. Um, is there spatial variability? Is there temporal variability? And these are the things we need to capture with our sampling plan. Um, well, is there some way that you can capture that variability in the source material also as you report out these results? We, the, the best we could do is, is, is test different source materials from different plants and, and collect it at different times, and that is exactly what we're doing. We've got cabinets full of source material um, collected from different bags and different times and different manufacturers. And then also add on top of that collected from different fields in the pilot study anyways, the, the phase one, which you'll hear about, um, sample was collected from individual fields with different ages and in different environments that have been out uh, used in the field. And we're folding that into this, this analytical process as well. Again, to, to figure out what to look for. And then there still may be surprises. We'll have to see. And I want to add that um, something similar uh, the comment from um, Dr. Sheldon is that we realize there's tremendous variability um, among different material and fields, but we want to make sure we have the capability to detect these chemicals. Not all of them will be uh, shown up in a particular sample, but the important thing is to establish that capability that if they are there, we'll see it. Dr. Abel? Yeah, so I think that there's uh, one other aspect of it, just following up on some of the previous comments, and that is that uh, I think as you go along, it would be useful and potentially informative uh, uh, as we get into the real world of applying this information to sort of compare what you see with the fresh material in terms of the listing compared to what you see with the degraded, deteriorated material. We have hypotheses about why the fresh material may be volatilizing certain uh, components preferentially. Um, but we also have some concerns, as, as Debbie mentioned, in terms of, uh, you know, degraded ozone, uh, ozone reactions, et cetera, as to why material that's been out that's aged. And I'm not sure exactly what the criteria is for defining which are aged materials, which are fresh materials, but I think we need to sort of have some confidence that, in fact, both extremes have been looked at. And from your working in the laboratory, that you can actually list and compare these things and sort of see what shows up in one bulk and not in the other. So I want to uh, pose a question um, to the panel. Are there any chemicals or classes of chemicals of particular interest uh, that should be focused on? You know, we have this broad range of chemicals that uh, we're developing laboratory capacity to analyze, but should there be any sort of targeted uh, direction in terms of that? Dr. Bennett. Um, well, I just wanted to comment that I think a lot of the things that we would be thinking of would be chemicals that would already be in that NIST database. And as uh, far as I understand, it, those you're already going to have anything you find from that NIST database that has a standard available, you guys will be purchasing the standard for, right? Am I interpreting it correctly? So that we already have a pretty wide set covered? Yeah, I guess my question really was for the field study. Should they be concentrating on certain compounds for the field study um, as opposed to um, the entire gamut? Dr. Sheldon? So, um, you know, a number of studies have been done, and the chemicals that have been targeted are those that are easy to analyze. It's the PAHs, it's the VOCs, et cetera. And every time a risk assessment is done with those, it doesn't show that, you know, there's much of a risk. And so that's sort of why we've gone to this, let's see what all these other chemicals are. And so my response is we need to wait and see what the other chemicals are, how potentially they are they toxic, 
do they have the potential to degrade and how is that going to impact the results? I mean, I think that study after study with sort of the standard methods is showing little risk, yet the public is still worried. And so as we are moving this, this forward, as was brought, brought uh, one of the first questions, is that how is this going to be different? And it is going to be different in that we are trying to understand what are the chemicals and what are the most hazardous chemicals that would be there that we haven't found before. Beautiful. That was a straw man question that you answered very well. Because <laughs> I, I, I think part of our purpose here is to communicate to the public that's interested, uh, you know, to try, try to have them have a better understanding of what this is all about. Because it's, you know, it's. Beautiful, highly technical uh, laboratory work uh, at this point, but again, has to rate back to the uh, concern that the public has. Dr. Kyle. I, I know you don't want more comments right now, but um, I, and this is, this is the other thing I'm worried about, so I'm just going to bring it up now because maybe it's the right time, and that is, well, and what about if this mixture is changing over time? We talked about that a little bit last time, and you all said, well, it's not, in some ways, not something we can deal with. But somehow, does, don't we have to figure out how to deal with that for all this work to be as valuable as it could be? So I'm just posing that again, that, um, you know, it's uncharacterized mixture, it's whatever tires people have from wherever they came from, made out of whatever. and. How is there any tractable way to check in with that so that we can see whether the results that we did now remain germane 10 years from now? I don't really expect an answer right now, but it, I mean, for, for, um, I mean, I think this is elegant and very impressive approach that you all have, and I'm very excited to understand it better. Um, but I still, I'm still worried about that issue, so that's why I bring it up. I'm sure as parents, we all have concerns. Um, part of it, we are in this study, I'm not saying that we are planning for the next future, what's the new generation, but we are going to look at few samples, few that are old and new that we can identify within California. So there's a whole spectrum of fields that we're going to cover. We hope we can cover it. And, but what is going to develop down the pipe in the next 10, 15 years, I think, uh, being out there, paying attention to what's coming, uh, new chemical coming out every day, uh, communication with agency, different department can help, uh, listening, talking to the business, uh, getting information from them helps too. So uh, proactive and also cover what we can do now. That's our approach. I also want to add that um, Randy is uh, looking at that issue, trying to um, uh, subject the material to um, high temperature or ozone or moisture to see the effect uh, or the change of chemicals release over time. And uh, as Patty has mentioned, we are also going to look at uh, new and old fields across California and try to compare them and see if there's any differences. Dr. Sheldon, did you have? Uh, oh. Dr. Maddalena. I'm going to respond that the, the testing we're doing in the lab doesn't capture the time scale I think you're talking about, the time scale of tires from the 40s through the 20, 2000s, you know, just tires from across the board have changed, the composition have changed. So it's difficult to capture that. I've got a slide on indoor air quality. We can do our best, but then things change. It's always moving, and so you have to be vigilant to keep track of changes in your system. Ed? So one other question, which may be outside your venue because it's for the next step, and that is for those chemicals that you don't identify uniquely, um, there are proprietary chemicals and so forth that are used, and you may not be able to uniquely identify some of these, but peaks that you see, will there be a, a peak X that gets carried forward and continue to be analyzed in the actual field studies, or are you only just planning on carrying forward what you identify? That's an excellent point. There, there is a record of these materials in the system, and so you can always go back to the database and look at a peak once it's identified down the road sometime. You're going to have that peak. Uh, 
it's going to be there. We don't, we don't not look for peaks. Um, instruments used to be designed that way where you could say, I just want to see PAHs, for example. And you had to do that to see them because they were at very low concentrations and there was a lot of noise. But the instrument technology is advanced now that you, you basically get everything and look, what, look at what you want to look at. So it's going to be there, and we can always go back. The time and expense required to go back, well, that's another question. It's not easy to do, but the information will be there from the field. So uh, while we're talking about everything, uh, I want to know if the, the panel has any thoughts about compounds that will be uh, detected that might not be from synthetic turf when they're doing the field study. You know, there's not everything in the uh, field environment will be coming from synthetic turf. And so that's a potential issue. I don't know if people have any comments about that. Staff would like us to have comments about that. I mean, I, I, I think uh, there are certain things that are going to be added to the field during maintenance, right? Uh, biocides, uh, because of the matrix. So I think you're looking at biocides, uh, correct? I mean, no, but it, what if there is a power plant? Um, uh, oh, deposition from nearby or... Is yeah, I mean, I think you could get a plant. lot of yeah. potential exposure uh, depending where the field is. And I, I think some of these fields might be downwind from uh, stationary sources that may produce things like metals or other compounds. I mean, the problem with that is that, you know, do you want to target, it's like a, a sampling strategy. Do you want to target to find those sites or do you want to target to avoid those sites? Because it might throw off the, it'll throw off the general conclusion. So you'd like to avoid them, but you'd like to find them because you'd like to find outliers and, and specific. So I, I, you know, I think you could, you could screen for that by just, if something is near a facility, there are databases about emissions. We could do a back of the envelope deposition to say how much would be like, likely be there from from uh, nearby facilities to see if it would rise to showing up as a peak. We would expect it to be a peak. Well, if I remember from reading the protocol for field testing, th there's going to be a s survey of a mile radius, radius around the field to, to look for those kinds of sources. and. Uh, yeah, I think it is an issue how we how we advise staff whether they should try to avoid sampling at such a facility, such a field. I mean, they're doing random selection of fields within categories, um, so they're not sort of pre-screening the that one mile radius around the facility. Dr. Sheldon. So I believe you're doing a feasibility study beforehand, and I think that part of that has to include something about, you know, uh, locations where you have real sources. Do you want to, you may want to eliminate them, but I think that maybe you want to develop a protocol where if there's a known source, you do do an upwind site at one location and at least try it during a feasibility study. Um, and then for many of the other sites, there's lots of information about air concentrations, other concentrations that you do need to somehow, in a report, let that be known. I was talking to Debbie about this earlier. I don't, you know, there's such an emphasis on PAHs, but I was looking at some of our old data from houses in Ohio where children play and the levels of PAHs in house dust are extraordinarily high. Um, and so with all of these things that are quote unquote ubiquitous chemicals, I think you are going to have to put them in perspective. It doesn't mean that, you know, the PAHs on a turf field aren't an issue, but how much of a risk is that relative to risk in other environments? I think that's part of the communication that eventually has to come out. But again, I think a pilot's test has to include some of that issue. And I guess if a field was uh, right next to a, a heavily trafficked roadway with lots of diesel vehicles, you'd expect some pH deposition just from that. You know. yeah, go ahead, Dr. Eckel. I have just, just a comment about um, 
you know, I think, uh, I don't want to go too far into the, the sampling design strategy yet, um, but I think that the idea of having these different strata in which you take the random samples of fields from, that, that is appealing in that um, that will be sort of a sample that is generalizable to what children are exposed to in California. So even if there are these point sources at some of these fields, at least it will be, you know, we can try to generalize that to what people are being exposed to throughout California. And I, I hope that if we have enough samples within each strata, we can identify those fields that have point sources as sort of outliers. You may, Dr. Kyle. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you for saying that, because it is uh, very related to what I was going to say, I think. Um, a number of the analyses that concluded there was no, not a concern here, you know, there's no serious health risk, did it by just looking at the health risk from the crumb, you know, and they'd say, well, we don't, we're not near our, our metric hazard index or whatever, as if this were the only source. And so, you know, what you're raising now is always the big issue of, well, this is one exposure add on to many others. And so how do we understand that? And, um, you know, you, you raise that in terms of that the, the, those other exposures could be relevant too. You, you, if you're going to add everything in, then we're, it's a different way to think about it than if we're just going to look at the incremental effect of the field. So it's a sampling issue, but it's also a fundamental kind of conceptual issue here. And for substances that we think children are already highly exposed to, well, should they be more exposed when they play soccer? You know, it, it's it it's kind of an optional exposure maybe in some ways compared to things that are harder to manage like, you know, uh, air pollution from vehicles or whatever. So it, this is kind of, I don't know when we unpack that or if we can unpack it um, today, but somewhere I think maybe with that, that, that larger discussion may be pertinent to this as well. Any other comments from the panel? If, if not, I think we should move on to the next uh, section, which is exposure pathway studies, time activity behavior study. Section 3.2.1 in the 